Thank you for your patience and cooperation. The warning will be given in a few moments. Hello YouTube and welcome, Frick here, and I've got another flight for you for my Let's Play Flight Simulator X FS Passengers video series. If you saw my last video, I tried to go from Duluth, Minnesota to Houghton, Michigan and was unsuccessful. We ran into weather right away and had to divert back to Duluth International and land. So in this flight, we are going to attempt that flight again. As you know, this is the third attempt now because my first attempt, my video recording software failed on me. The second attempt, weather made me fail. And so hopefully this time we will do good. So we are going from KDLH or Duluth International Airport in Duluth, Minnesota, crossing parts of Lake Superior to almost the northernmost portion of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan as we are flying to KCMX or Houghton County Memorial Airport in Houghton, Michigan. Again, we are attempting another morning flight. So it is again, another five in the morning flight. <clears throat> Weather this time is clear, so it should be a non-factor. I just want to get to Houghton, Michigan this time. So it is a morning flight. We should, uh, about halfway, start to see the sunrise, and by the time we're in Houghton, Michigan, it should be relatively light out. Again, my startup uh, checklists have already uh, been somewhat accomplished. I'm about halfway through my pre-start checklist. As you can see, my battery switch is on as well as my alternator switch. Avionics are on and panel lights are on. When I had the panel lights off, it was dark. So I have them on just so you're not staring at it. Really dark, uh, With that said, I do want to start running my checklists again uh, to get my engine started because again, you can run out of batteries uh, in FSX. You, they, they can run out of juice and it happens relatively quickly and I don't want that to happen. So what I'm going to do is quick finish my pre-start checklist. So I'm about halfway through. As always, if you want to follow along in the checklist that I'm using, there is a link for that checklist in my description box below. Pre-start checklist about halfway through, battery switches on, panel lights are on, flight controls have been checked and are free and correct. As you can see, my flaps are up. Fuel quantity is about 50% and I'm going to add a little more once we get into FS passengers. Fuel selector valve is on both. Avionics switch is on and you can verify it in the avionics panel. I'm going to check weather and request clearance once we start boarding passengers. I can't turn the knob to standby on my transponder, but it is squawking 1200 and my beacon, which you can see down here, is on. So free start checklist is complete. So I could go into my startup checklist, but what I'm going to do is go into FS passengers and start to load a flight. So I'm going to start a flight. Two passengers who want to again try to fly with me, which is, I guess, a good thing. Um... So we're going to add two passengers, we're going to view them, 280 pound individuals, not too bad. We're going to bump our fuel up to, we're going to do 60%, um, not sure how much weight in fuel. Technically, so uh, Nolan Manley, he's uh, one of my subscribers, gave me the input that this is how many pounds of luggage you can add. Uh, the more pounds of luggage you add, the more cargo you get paid for at the end of your flight. So uh, it is advantageous to technically bump up your luggage as high as possible and then compensate your fuel down a little less so your aircraft load isn't over 100%. Now, in my last flight, I had more than 120 pounds of baggage, but I just kind of remembered that a Cessna 172 actually has a luggage compartment, and it's got a weight limit of 120 pounds. Uh, and as I'm trying to make my videos as realistic as possible, what I am going to do is I'm only going to use 120 pounds of luggage, uh, because technically... Uh, you should not carry more than that in your default Cessna 172 or in any Cessna 172 for that matter because uh, the cargo compartment is not very big. You don't want to throw off your center of gravity too much and they do have those restrictions where there is a 120 pound weight limit. Uh, so with that said, I'm only going to bring 120 pounds of luggage uh, just because I do not want to... Uh, be that guy who exceeds it. So I'm going to bump up my fuel to 70% and have a little extra fuel uh, for this flight and then 120 pounds of baggage. I'm going to have my two passengers uh, destination. We're going to set that and that's going to be KCMX and I'm going to okay that. It's Houghton County and my British lady set. will say 
it is set. I'm going to go in and select type. It's going to be another normal flight. And so we got 120 pounds of luggage. We have two passengers, 70 pounds of fuel. That was checked in both wings, so we should be good to go. I'm going to OK real-time load, two minutes, shift E to open the doors. Center of gravity is a little better this time. My never exceed speed is 163 knots. Uh, all the speeds are good. As you can see, they change slightly sometimes with the uh, weight of the aircraft. I have two passengers, and takeoff weight right there is 2,535 pounds. So what I'm going to do is start my flight. Our aircraft is down. I'm going to move this back up to the top right corner as always. Shift E to open my door and my passengers can start boarding. With that, I'm going to go into my startup checklist. Engine and propeller area clear, so get out of the way, passengers. I am starting up my propeller. Get away from me. I'm going to crack my throttle about a quarter of an inch. Mixture is going to full rich. Fuel pump switch is technically kind of your primer. I'm going to have it on for about five seconds quick. Uh, magneto starter one, switch. Two, I'm gonna five, quick start that. Four, five, orbit one, five, nine, or zero. Maybe if I can grab it. Fuel pump is coming off since the engine turned over. Throttle is coming down to idle. As you can see, it, it is spinning. Engine is on. Uh, annunciator lights. Nothing's on right now. Oil pressure is gonna come on because I am an idle. All my engine instruments look good, and my ammeter is showing that I am getting a positive charge. So that appears to be good. So my engine startup checklist is complete. So I'm gonna go into my before taxi checklist. So I'm gonna turn on my nav lights. I'm gonna turn on my taxi lights. Heading indicator. I'm gonna make sure that that is roughly at a zero nine five heading, which is gonna be our initial heading. And I might adjust that as needed. Also, uh, all my avionics panel is set. 112.6, which you can see in the nav. 2 frequency is for the Duluth VOR. 108.8 is the Ironwood, which is going to be our first VOR intersection point. 112.8 is the Houghton VOR, and 110.3 is the Houghton ILS information. So again, I'm not going to be landing ILS, I just simply use that for reference. 121.9 is going to be um, Duluth Ground, 124.1 is Duluth ATIS, 118.3 is Duluth Tower, and 125.45 is Duluth Approach. So I have all the initial frequencies that I am going to be using right there. Also, you can see that my DME is set to Duluth, uh, which is nav 2. Everything else checks out okay. Passengers are loaded, so I'm going to hit my seatbelt sign, and I'm going to shut my main cabin door. And I'm going to quick go to COM1 at 124.1 and listen to my ATIS information. Airport information, India 10142, wind, calm. So again, we are using perfect weather. Altimeter is set to 29992, which is standard barometric pressure. We have uh, ATIS information India, runway 27, and no clouds, no wind. All of that is a non-factor. It should be a perfect flight, is what I am hoping. So with that, uh, what I am going to do is I'm going to open up my ATC window, and I'm going to shrink it because I don't like it that big, and I'm going to request a taxi departure to the east. Duluth, Round, Papa, Hotel, Quebec, 1 1, with India. Request taxi for takeoff, departure to the east. Papa, Hotel, Quebec, 1 1, taxi 2 and hold short of runway 27, using taxi weight Alpha 5. Contact tower on 118.3 when ready. Alright, we'll acknowledge taxi that. And hold short, runway 27, via taxi weight Control Alpha period 5. to turn Papa, off my Hotel, parking Quebec, brake, one, and I'm going to hit Shift P and start my pushback. And as you can see, we're pushing back. Taxiway Alpha 5. All of these are on. I did get penalized for using my landing lights, even though my uh, taxi lights don't seem to illuminate anything. I did get penalized for them. Whatever. 
progressive taxi I'm gonna quick turn that on look behind me just to check where I'm supposed to go what I'm gonna do is end my pushback and then I'm gonna hit shift P again and right away hit 2 and that'll turn my tail to the right and I'm gonna almost do a complete circle of blah, 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 blah. excuse me a circle around um, so I can get on to that taxiway that I need to get on which is right there we are basically right there so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit shift P again that concludes my pushback I'm kinda of running my taxi checklist right now uh, so what I am doing is giving a little bit of throttle turning getting on to the taxiway this will be a nice short taxi cuz look we are already pretty much there I like these kind of taxis instead of when you have to go all the way down to the other side of the runway those ones are the ones I'm not a big fan on I'm gonna hit control period and what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our before takeoff checklist uh, which is basically going to be an engine run up and things like that. So parking brake is set. Fuel quantity, you can see it's about 60% still. Fuel selector valve is on both. Throttle is idle. Mixture is rich. Alternator switch is verified on. Throttle, I'm going to bump that up to 1800 RPM on the tachometer. And I'm going to drop my magnetos once it gets revved up. pretty much stable at about 1800 drop to my left magneto and you see that little dip so the magneto is working go to both and we'll test the other magneto two down a little bit of a dip in the tachometer about 50 rpm and going back up so both my magnetos are working amp meter is still showing in the green so uh, throttle is coming back down to idle oil temperature is in the green as is the oil pressure um, and I lost where I was. Elevator trim, we're going to set that for takeoff. Flaps, we're going to do about 10 degrees of flaps. Flight controls are free and correct. Radios and avionics are set. Taxi lights are coming off. But my landing lights are coming on, as are my strobe lights. Pedo heat, I am not going to do because weather is perfectly clear. Transponder is on, squawking 1200. Request takeoff clearance is my next step. Oh, I gotta turn the tower. So, COM2, Fargo Tower, Ground uh, Duluth Tower, right here. Request takeoff clearance, VFR. Tower, I cannot tower, talk today, holy one, cow. One, at runway 27, ready for takeoff. Departure to the east. Papa Hotel, Quebec 1 1, cleared for takeoff. Runway 27, departure to the east, approved. Alright, so we got our clearance, we are cleared for takeoff. That is two nine or nine or two, so we are good on the altimeter. Coming on to the active runway, which is runway two seven, as you can see by the runway markings. Gonna quick hold right there. Double check all my lighting and whatnot. So beacon is on, landing light is on, off, on, on. That all looks good. We're not gonna turn on our fuel pump. Panel lights are on, 10 degrees of flaps. Takeoff is set for our trim. We should be good to go, so here we go. I'm gonna be doing my takeoff checklist, but I'm not gonna vocalize it as always because too much happens at once. Here we go. Looking good right now. Decision speed, 55 knots, looking good. 65 knots, still looking good. Rotate. And we are off the ground. Since we are getting established in a decent climb, first our flaps are coming up. And I'm pushing over a little to the left. Don't want to do that. Try to center myself back out. Speeding up slightly, we want to try to get established at around 80 knots for our climb out. <clears throat> Look below us, and we are still over the 
runway as you can see the runway is coming up to the end right over here what I'm gonna be doing is slowly start turning to the left Also, one thing, you might have noticed it my last flight, but there's more cars on the ground, and the ground looks slightly different from when we did our initial approach in my Let's Play video episode 3, I think it was, or episode 4, when I came to Duluth. Uh, I actually have a new add-on installed. It is the UTX add-on. Uh, I think it's like Universal Train X. Uh, but what it does is it adds some more roads and maps out the ground uh, a little differently. So I'm still running Orbix, uh, ORBX, as one of my add-ons, but I also have this one, which adds a lot of other cool features. So the ground is a lot uh, more interesting to look at right now. I'm going to start uh, turning close to the east. Kind of flew out of uh, traffic pattern area and see another airport right over here there's a couple airports here I know of there's another one on like this little uh, land island thingy on the uh, lake of Lake Superior so that's one I've wanted to fly at for some reason I've never flown onto it yet though see it's perfectly clear skies this time no thunder no lightning you can see stars that makes me happy that is the radial we want to intercept which is 095 radial so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bump my heading to about 105 again and I'm gonna turn on my autopilot heading hold altitudes coming on and off so I should have control of the altitude at least, but my heading will be controlled by my heading hold autopilot. We're still in the climb out. As you can see, we're going at about 80 knots. We have a VSI of about 500. It's dipping a little. It was about 500 to 600. We're at about 3,500 feet. I'm going to start leaning my mixture a little. And as you could hear, the engine revved up slightly, got a little more power once I leaned it. And you can see my VSI is also coming back up to about 700 feet a minute. There he is, Duluth International that we took off from. Right off the left wing. We were parked in the terminal, which is right there, and basically went straight there and went along that entire runway 27. So we're going to tune to Duluth Approach, which you can see is 125.45, which I have set down here. So I'm going to go to COM2, and I'm going to request a flight following, and we'll get Duluth a new squat approach, code. Duluth Approach, Papa Hotel, Quebec 1, 1, is type Cessna, Skyhawk, 3 miles south of Duluth, request flight following. Hyper 6 ray Quebec, Romeo, turn right, heading 1, right, X, Papa Hotel, Quebec 1, 1, Duluth Approach, squat 0, 1, 2, 3. 0, 1, 2. Poppin Hotel Quebec 1 1 radar contact 3 miles south of Duluth 3000 Niner Hundred Altimeter 2 Niner Niner 2 2 Niner Niner 2 will ignore We try to acknowledge that but we can't right now Copy Papa Hotel Quebec 1 1 so I acknowledge my radar contact I ori originally had my uh, altitude hold set for 5500 but since skies are perfectly clear and everything is nice with the weather, I'm actually going to climb at a slightly higher altitude. I'm going to go up to 7,500, and that'll be my cruise altitude. We're still on that heading. As you can see, though, our VOR now, our VOR flag, turned from a to flag to a from flag. Uh, this is that 095 radial that we want to intercept, and as you can see, it is slowly deviating to the left, so we're about to get onto that radial shortly. And once we do that, what we will do is adjust our heading, so our heading bug is 095. And then hopefully we will stay perfectly on that 095 radial, which will take us to our first VOR intersection, which is going to be the Ironwood VOR. Once we get uh, completely leveled off and airborne, what I'll do is I'll pull over Sky Vector and I'll show you my flight planning for this flight. 
And also, uh, I have reasoning as to why I'm doing a morning flight as well. So I'll kind of show you that as well. Uh, so something, if you, I guess if you could say, look forward to once we get uh, leveled out. We are still climbing quite nicely. We're almost at 5,000 feet already. So I'm pretty happy with how the climb out is coming. Get a beautiful view of Duluth below us, Duluth International. Uh, the city all along the uh, coast here, right here, of Lake Superior. Look out the other wing. It's a relatively big city. If you've never been to Duluth, Minnesota, and you want to go to a beautiful city, uh, I would definitely recommend it, because Duluth, Minnesota is a very beautiful city. So uh, There's a lot of hills there. There's the Lake Michigan there, which is... Uh, quite nice. The city's built right on it. There's some places where you can get to the top of these big phenomenal hills uh, that overlook all of the city or a lot of the city and then a lot of the lake. Uh, so it's actually a quite uh, scenic city to visit. So if you're ever in the northern part of Minnesota and want to see something uh, pretty nice, a good city, I'd definitely recommend going to Duluth. If you're there in the winter, it is cold, because it is northern Minnesota. But if you're a hockey fan, they do have a Division I hockey team, uh, Minnesota and Duluth Bulldogs. I'm not a fan. I'm a University of North Dakota Fighting Sioux fan. But, you know, they do have a good Division I hockey team. And they just built a new uh, arena for them, I think, two or three years ago. So they have a new nice hockey arena. So if you're a fan of hockey, which I am, and you like uh, college hockey, and you're in Duluth in the winter, check it out. That's my uh, that's my uh, plug for Duluth, even though I'm not even from Duluth, but it's a nice city. We are still climbing out, as you can see. We've got about 2,000 feet left in our climb, and we're almost to where we can intercept that radial, which is what we want to do. Six point three nautical miles away from the VOR as well, and everything is looking just perfect right now. Hopefully, this will be a completely uneventful flight because holy cow, I don't want to have to deal with unexpected weather again and some of the some of the things that we dealt with last time. I was not expecting it. Ten o'clock, one zero miles, turn left, heading zero seven five, report runway in sight just about vertical once this gets vertical what i'm going to do is adjust this heading bug to a 095 heading and that should keep us on that radial if you hear the engine fluctuating i'm trying to lean the mixture a little more just to get a slightly more power Next time this deviates one notch is when I'm going to adjust my heading. There we go. We're going to 095 heading. And hopefully this will keep us right on this radial that we want to be on, which um, you can't really see. You kind of have to go by what the indicator shows. But it's about halfway, so I'm hoping that's about a 095 radial. As you can see, we only have 1,000 more feet to go, or 1,100 feet, if you want to be technically accurate. Do a quick, quick cross check of all our instruments. As we can see, our fuel is still good. We're not doing any leaking or anything. EGT exhaust gas temperature is good. Fuel flow is still in the green. Ammeter and vacuum are in the green. Oil pressure is in the green. And temp is in the green. So everything is looking good with our engine instruments. Our tachometer is not showing any huge deviations in the RPM. So we're doing good there as well. Still climbing out. If you're wondering why I chose zero, uh, or 7,500 feet for my altitude, well, there is a VFR cruising altitude. Uh, it, 
I don't believe it's set in stone. I don't believe it's a law or official requirement. But what it what it is is basically uh, when you're flying on an easterly heading, I believe the the heading has to be between zero zero one degrees to one eighty degrees, or maybe it's uh, zero 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 degrees or three sixty to 179 degrees so any any easterly heading um then what you do is you fly at an altitude of a odd number so like 7,000 feet or 3,000 feet plus 500 uh so that is why i'm at 7,000 feet 500 because it's an odd number seven is odd plus 500 or i could have done 5,500 so it's you know, again, still an odd plus 500. Now, if you're going on a westerly heading, so 180 degrees to 359 degrees, so you're heading somewhat west, then what you do is you fly at an even number plus 500, so 8,500 or 6,500. That way, if you have two aircraft that are flying on the same flight path, they will automatically be de-conflicted by altitude by at least a thousand feet. Uh, so that is the VFR cruising altitudes that you should try to adhere to. So that is why I'm on an even number altitude, 7,000 feet plus 500. As you can see, we are almost leveled at uh, 7,500, so I'm going to start to level out as well. And to do that, I'm just giving it a little bit of forward yoke, slowly killing some of my vertical speed, but trying to get a little more uh, actual cruising speed, a little more airspeed. And I'm also slightly adjusting my trim as I do this to try to get us nice and leveled out. But I do need to get up a little higher, another 100 feet, which it's doing right there. A little forward pressure on the yoke again. There comes that VSI down. Doing good. And we are basically straight and level, as you can see. So what I'm going to do is turn on my altitude hold, and that is going to take control of my altitude. And we are officially on an autopilot, so we have our heading hold on on that 095 radial, which it's deviating us a little to the north. So what I'm going to do is actually turn to about a 098, uh, and hopefully I'll intercept that again. We're still relatively in the same direction. I'm not too concerned by small deviations like that, but uh, it is something I want to watch because you want to stay on course. And we're just cruising at 7,500 feet, and our airspeed is increasing, which is good. What we want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring over Sky Vector real quick. So here is Sky Vector. I'll make it a little bigger. And I'm going to show you some of my flight planning that I'm doing for this. So if you're unfamiliar with uh, northern Minnesota and Michigan, here is the United States. Uh, here's Minnesota and here's the upper peninsula of Michigan right here. And you can see right here is Lake Superior. Uh, Duluth is about where my crosshairs are. It's pretty much on the westernmost point of Lake Superior where the crosshairs are. Now where we're going to is Houghton, Michigan, which is on this little peninsula of the upper peninsula of Michigan, about two-thirds of the way up, about right here. So that is where Houghton, Michigan is. So as you can see, there is Lake Superior in between us. Now, with that in mind, here is Duluth. So here's Lake Superior and the westernmost point, and here's the city of Duluth, and here's Duluth International Airport, which we took off from. Now, over here is Houghton County Memorial Airport, or Houghton, Michigan, which as you can see, if I kind of move over and zoom out, it is pretty much the northernmost uh, airport in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. You see there is a little more up here, but if I zoom in onto that, you can see that there are maybe a couple small towns, but there really is no airports indicated on my aeronautical chart. So because of that, I am flying to Houghton. Uh, also, again, if you like uh, college hockey and Division One hockey, they have a team in the Division I uh, college hockey. They play for the WCHA, uh, and that's uh, Michigan Tech University. Another fun fact if you like college hockey. Anyway, as you notice, though, we were flying on a 095 heading, and you can see this radial right here. 
is that 095 radial. And so that's actually the radial that we are flying. So as you can see, we're taking not a direct route to Houghton, Michigan. Now my reasoning for that is right now it's the 20th of April. It is still early in the spring. Lake Superior is the largest freshwater lake in the world. It's also the coldest freshwater lake or coldest of all the Great Lakes. And it's the biggest of all the Great Lakes. Um, with that said, since it's the early part of April, Lake Superior is still going to be frigidly, frigidly cold because it is the coldest lake. It doesn't warm up very fast because of how big and deep it is. And there might be some places where there still might be ice on it. I Probably not anymore, but there might be. But that water is going to be frigid cold. It's going to be maybe around freezing, probably a little above freezing. But it, I mean, still, even if it's 40 degrees and you get soaking wet in 40 degree weather or water and it's only 50 degrees out, outside, I'm actually looking out my window and it's kind of sleeting out still. It's not rain, but it's like a sleet. So that's uh, the thing you can love about, you know, Minnesota, North Dakota, things like that. So it is really cold. Now, in real life, I would not do a direct flight to Houghton, Michigan. And the reasoning for this is because I would not want to be in my Cessna 172, which is a single engine, single prop plane. I would not want to have to do a flight over this much water. Now, my reasoning for that is if my engine were to cut out and I had to make a crash landing, I would have no glide distance if, especially if I was in this area here to make it to any kind of land. So I would have to crash land in the water. Now, even if I did have life preservers, even if I did have an inflatable raft even, chances are is you would get completely soaking wet uh, once you crash land. When you get completely soaking wet in this frigidly cold water, and when it's only 50 degrees outside, your chances of hypothermia are extremely high, and you could get it very, very quickly. So what I would rather do is feel comfortable flying along the coastline right here, where if I had to make an emergency landing, at least I would have land that I could crash into, and I would not be freezing cold through the water. I would have um, other issues to worry about. So say the Upper Peninsula of Michigan right here, I'm not sure if you've ever driven through it or flown over it, but is it, it is extremely forested. So there are other concerns. So if I lost an engine flying right here, chances are I'm going to have to try to find a clearing or a road to crash land on. Otherwise, I'm going to hit a tree and a small Cessna 172 crashing into a tree is not going to be a good thing. However, if I can't find a clearing, then I am close enough where I can make a crash landing on the water, but right next to the coastline where I could hopefully then swim to shore, take off my clothes, uh, where I would not be soaking wet, and have a lot better chance of survival. So... I'm, it's strictly for realism's sake is why I'm not doing a direct route over all of the water because I would not want to lose an engine above this water. Another thing about Lake Superior and the area around it, as you can see, it's not that densely populated. Uh, so if I did crash land somewhere here, there's not a whole lot of uh, options for teams getting out there for search and rescue. And on top of that, it is a really big lake. So even if they did have an area to find me at, it's still a big lake and hard to to find anything so that is why i'm going across the land now if i was down at maybe like lake michigan which is down here and wanted to cross somewhere around here you know i'd be maybe a little more willing to do that just because lake michigan is going to be a little warmer it's still going to be pretty cold but it is going to be a little warmer and on top of that it is a lot more heavily populated i mean you have chicago down here you have green bay you have milwaukee and and places like that and a lot of coastal towns also there is a lot of ferry traffic between uh michigan and wisconsin illinois on Lake Michigan. So if I had to make a crash landing, there is a lot higher chances or probability for a successful recovery in Lake Michigan, but in Lake Superior, not so much. So that's why I am doing this flight where I'm coming down here on the 095 radial to right here is um, Ironwood or the Ironwood VOR. And then I'm going to turn to a northeasterly heading to get to Houghton, Michigan. I'm going to quick minimize that, acknowledge my One, handoff. Three, four, Papa, 134.55, so we're going to adjust that. 
Contact Minneapolis Center. Papa Hotel, Quebec 1 1 with you. Papa Hotel, Quebec 1 1, Minneapolis Center. Roger. Altimeter 2 9 9 2. Alright, so everything is still good. We got our flight follow flight following and 299 or 2 is still set so I'm going to bring back Sky Vector. So that is where where I'm doing my flight planning. That's why I'm going down and up uh, and my reasoning behind it. Now another thing to notice is you can see there are a lot of MOAs up here uh, and also restricted fly zones. And if you are unfamiliar with MOAs, a MOA is a military operating area. It's where military training takes place and flight for the military takes place. Now, I know up here in Duluth, they do have fighter jets, so there is a high probability that there could be training for fighter jets in this MOA, and I'm not sure what the Upper Peninsula of Michigan has. Um, who knows, they might have fighters, they might have tankers, they might have other things, or otherwise, uh, you know, some of those fighter jets might come over to these MOAs as well. So, there are military operating in these MOAs, and the pilots aren't going to want to look for a little Cessna 172. So one thing about a MOA is under VFR flight rules, which we are doing, visual flight rules, you technically legally are able to fly through a MOA. You do not have to get clearance to enter a MOA. You are legally able to fly through it under VFR. Under IFR, or instrument flight rules, you do have to get clearance in order to enter a MOA. Now, if you want to know where to get that clearance information or other information about the MOA, I will show you that in a second. So if you come down here in the legend, you can see that there is this MOA information. And here are the names of the MOAs. You can see uh, on Tonagon, Snoopy East, Snoopy West, all the MOAs there. There's also altitudes, times of use. If you're flying IFR and need to get... Uh, permission to fly through that MOA, then you can go contact the controlling agency, which you can see it's Minneapolis Center for all of them here. And here are the frequencies to contact Minneapolis Center to get approval into that MOA. But for visual flight rules, I do not need to do that. However, out of respect for the military, I don't want to fly with my slow moving 100 knot Cessna 172 where there might be fighter jets or other military aircraft flying out of respect for the military and out of the respect for those pilots who are going to want to focus on their training and not having to look for tiny Cessna 172s um, I try to avoid flying through MOAs it's just a personal preference I can do it I have done it but I try not to so what I do is come over and look at the legend and here I can see there is an altitude for all of these MOAs now this altitude here is the floor for a MOA. So as you can see, Ontonagon is the main MOA that we have to worry about. And the floor for that, I got another uh, handoff already, four minutes later, whatever, I'm not going to do it. Uh, Ontonagon, uh, the floor for that is 500 feet AGL. Well, I'm obviously not going to fly below 500 feet AGL. Uh, I'm going to be way too close to the land. I'm probably going to crash into a tree and explode into a fireball of death. I don't want to do that. Now, there are ceilings for MOAs, too, and if you look down here, you can see it extends up to flight level 180. Well, obviously, again, in my Cessna 172 that's not turbocharged, I'm not going to get to an altitude above um, that. I'm going to quick acknowledge this. And I'm just going to tune right there. Minneapolis. So I'm not going to fly above 180 because my default Cessna 172, you know, I'm going to be lucky if I can maybe get to 11 or 12,000 feet. There's no way I'm getting to 18,000 feet. So I can't overflow it, fly it. I can't underfly it. So my options are either going around it or flying through it. Well, I'm going to fly through it because I don't want to have to deviate all the way around a large MOA like that. But then what I look at is this time of use. So we can see Ontonagon is open from 0800 to 1800. So if you're not familiar with military time, that's 8 in the morning till 6 p.m. Um, so what I am doing is I did a morning flight. I took off at 5 in the morning, and I should be landing in Houghton at around, you know, 7 or 8. It's going to be 7 Duluth time, 8 Michigan time relatively so i'm crossing a time zone but still even with that time zone change i should be landing before that ontonagon moa opens up so what i am doing is i am mitigating my flight through that moa where those pilots aren't going to want to have to look for me out of respect for the military i am flying at a time where that moa is not in use now there are phone numbers that you can contact too if you want to find out if 
there are going to be military op aircraft operating in that MOA during that time of use because a lot of times uh, there might not be any aircraft in that MOA during the time of the use where you could just fly through anyway. But that is why I am doing a morning flight is to avoid flying through that MOA when it is a use used time. And obviously for a flight in Flight Simulator X, I'm not going to call to see if there are aircraft flying in there. So I'm not going to fly below it or above it. I'm going to go through it, but not when it is in use. So that is um, my flight planning and why I have chosen the route that I have chosen. So I'm not going direct because A, there is a lot of MOAs up there, which I'd be mitigated because I am flying bef before they open, but there is that restricted airspace and also I don't want to fly over all that water. So I'm flying down here to avoid the water and the restricted airspace, and I'm also flying early to avoid flying through this Ontonagon MOA when it is in use. So that is my reasoning for my flight planning. I hope you guys enjoy some of those lessons on why I choose the flight planning that I choose and also hope you learn something about MOAs. So anyway, we are cruising at 7,500 feet. We are going at a nice cruise speed of about 100 knots. It's showing about a ground speed of 110 knots and we're at 7,500 feet straight and level on that 095 radial. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to keep this flight going, but I am going to pause the video and I will bring you back if anything changes. I am back guys, uh, there have been a few changes, as you can see we have now intercepted that radial, or that VOR I should say, for Ironwood, so what I'm going to do is, you can see that the flag is on the 2 flag, and what I'm going to do is just change my OBS until I intercept a radial that'll take me directly to it, uh, which you can see right there, and you can see it's about a 100 heading. So what I'm gonna do is adjust my heading to 100, which it pretty much was on. So this should take us pretty much directly to that Ironwood VOR. Also what I'm gonna do is switch my DME from NAV2, which you can see we're 50 miles away from uh, Duluth, and I'm gonna change it to uh, that Ironwood VOR, and you can see we're 34 nautical miles away. So we're cruising at 7,500 feet. We're on that radial to intersup, intercept now uh, the Ironwood VOR, and we're flying at 100 knots. Now one other thing I wanted to show you is, let's just look out the wing. And that's not the right button, but if we look out to the wing, we can see that the sun is starting to break, and you can see it's illuminating Lake Michigan down here, which is pretty cool to look at. Look out the right wing, and we can see there is a city down here, and we can see all these islands up here. And then we see how the sky is just starting to get that orange tint to it from the sunrise. Looking out the right wing, we can see there is another city right there. And how the sky, you know, fades from that orange sunrise down to the darker purples and blues of the night sky. Uh, one thing I love about flying general aviation aircraft is you get some spectacular views. And... To me, just looking out the window right now, albeit it is a video game, I know it's not real, but you get the sunrise, you get it illuminating Lake Superior, you get the islands and the city lights down below you. To me, it's a pretty, pretty spectacular view that you can see, even in-game in Flight Simulator X. And that's just one of the awesome benefits to flying general aviation is some of the intimate flying experiences that you get. With a smaller GA aircraft, you get to feel every bump of turbulence. All the turns and everything are a lot more uh, close to you. You feel everything with the aircraft. And that's one of the things that's awesome about these smaller GA aircraft. You know, there are a lot of Let's Play FSX videos or FS Passengers videos uh, where they're flying these giant airline uh, airliners basically you're flying you know your BOA 777s and your airbuses and things like that but you know while with flying some of those really large aircraft there is kind of a cool factor or a wow factor you do lose a lot of the intimacy that you get of the flying experience that you just don't get with those big ones but you get with these littler aircraft you know they're flying at 35 thousand feet and they're definitely not going to get the same view that we're getting you know they're not going to see these cities the way we're seeing them the islands the way we're seeing them they're still going to get a little bit of a sunrise and you kind of get a cool sunrise too because you are so high out of the atmosphere but you don't get to see you know the land start to illuminate the light coming up on the lake 
And so you lose a lot of that intimate experience that you get with flying a GA aircraft when you're flying one of those bigger airliners. And that is personally why I like so much flying some of these smaller GA aircraft. So, you know, I am going to be upgrading an aircraft throughout this Let's Play, but it is going to be a small mom and pop airline. It's not going to be anything huge. I'm probably never going to get a giant Airbus or Boeing 777 or anything like that. You know, I'm going to maybe get a two prop aircraft or, you know, something like that, a small multi engine prop plane, uh, turbocharged or something like that, where I can get to a higher altitude. But for the most part, a lot of them are going to be these smaller general aviation aircraft. And it's not only just because uh, I don't want to spend the money or play that long to get one of the larger aircraft, but it's because I love flying the smaller GA aircraft because it is a lot more intimate experience in real life and even in the game. You just, it, to me, it's a cool experience. So it's one thing that I try to try to stick to. So that is kind of my uh, hippie-ish type flying intimacy speech, I guess. Uh, I don't know how interested you are with uh, the views of FSX. You know, since it is not real life, I understand. Uh, but in real life, if you ever fly some of these smaller aircraft, it's kind of an interesting experience because once you fly them, it's it's addicting. You don't want to go back to anything else. You, I love flying the smaller aircraft. Uh, I love flying in giant airliners too. But you know, there's there's something about hopping into a Cessna 172 or a Piper Cherokee or a Grumman. You know some of these small aircraft that that is a lot more intimate it's a fun experience so i definitely if you haven't gone into a G, ga aircraft in real life i would definitely recommend it because it is a whole different flying experience compared to that of an airliner with that said you can see that we're now 26 nautical miles away from the ironwood vor let's quick find out where we are on the map so i'm going to bring over sky vector and we know that we are somewhere along this radio. We knew this because we have intercepted that radio. It's a 095 radio from Duluth. And then once we connected to the Ironwood VOR, we knew that we are along the 100 radial now, which is just slightly below it, but basically pretty much the same radio. So we just don't know where we were. Well, kind of visually, we can kind of figure it out uh, by just using references outside. But if we wanted to also uh, use the map to figure it out. If we scroll to the bottom, we can see down here, I'm going to zoom in to about this field level, this legend here, which is for distances. You can see there's three lines. There's a nautical miles line, a statute miles line, and a kilometers line. And all these little notches are in values of 10 miles or kilometers. So since we are using nautical miles for our DME, we're going to use that nautical mile line. We knew we were, what was it, 25, 25 nautical miles away. So what we can do is we can see that about 10 nautical miles is about an inch on our display. So what I am going to do is I'm going to go back up to where we were, and we're flying from that Ironwood VOR, which is right here. If we go out about an inch, we can see it's about right here. About another inch, it's about right here. And about right here then would be about another halfway. So we're about in the middle right here. Uh, so that pretty much lines up with what we were flying because when I was going over my hippie speech about the beauties of flying smaller gen general aviation aircraft, we were probably around right here because off the left wing, we saw that there was a city. Off the right wing, we saw there was another city. We could see all the islands off our left wing as well. So we knew we were along this radial and we could kind of visually check where everything was. Now, I know I should be about right here. So if I look up out of the aircraft, we should see that we should basically be starting to enter onto water again. And if I look down, we can see that we are basically entering onto water again. So there is land off to our right, a small little peninsula-ish thing. And we're kind of over this land right here. I'm gonna zoom out. This little uh, segment of land and we are starting to cross onto the water again. So basically everything is visually checking out in game to what we are doing on the uh, aeronautical chart. So we are crossing this little landmass here and going onto the water here. So that is a way you can kind of visually check out where you are in reference to an aer aeronautical chart using your DME, distance measuring equipment, and your VOR radials to find out where you are on an aeronautical chart and then visually check it. So it's kind of a cool little trick. So we know where we are. 
With that said, we are still 20 nautical miles away from that VOR. I'm going to cut the video again and bring you back uh, once we get a little closer to that and start making our heading change to head up to Houghton, Michigan. Hello guys, I am back. As you can see, we're 7.4 nautical miles away from the Ironwood VOR. If I dip my nose slightly, you can see the city of Ironwood is just in front of us. If I go out like this, you can see that the Ironwood Airport is right here. So you can see Ironwood down here and the Ironwood Airport and the VOR is around that location as well. So also you can see I lost my uh, flight following. Uh, one of the non-real realistic parts of my flying is uh, I had to let my dog out and because of that I lost my flight following so I have to contact Minneapolis Center which I'm doing right there and request a new flight following. Center, Papa, Hotel, Quebec, one, one is type Cessna, Skyhawk, six miles west of Kilo, India, Whiskey, Delta, request flight following. Papa, Hotel, Quebec, one, one, Minneapolis Center, clock zero, one, seven, five, Zero one seven five. Papa Hotel Quebec one one radar contact six miles six of Kilo India Whiskey Delta seven thousand five hundred altimeter two nine nine or two. All right, two nine or nine or two. I'm gonna acknowledge that. Next, what I'm gonna do is since we are near this VOR, what I've I'm going to do is bring over Sky Vector and to get to Houghton Airport, which is right here from Ironwood, you can see that we basically have to fly on the 059 radial, which you can kind of see right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make our adjustments. I'm going to turn my heading to that closer of a 059 heading. It's going to be about a 065 right now. And what I'm going to do also is change this to a 0 uh, five nine heading which is right about there and as you can see we are off to the left of that radial that is why I'm not directly flying a zero five nine heading that's why I'm flying a zero six five heading which is gonna push me a slightly to the east so hopefully I'm actually gonna adjust this to a zero seven zero I think eventually to where I will intercept that uh, radial. As you can see also though we have not quite passed that Ironwood VOR so we still have a two flag. Once we change past that you can see we're getting closer to it. Once we pass it it will turn to a from flag and then that VOR radial will start to deflect over to the left. We are flying over land. We pretty much will be over land now the entire rest of the flight. Uh, we're just going to be flying straight towards the sunrise, what you can kind of see right now. Uh, and it will take us up the peninsula to where Houghton, Michigan is. You can see the sun has come up a lot more. Uh, you can see a pretty good view of uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. It's kind of nice. And you can see how forested it is down there. So remember how I said if I lost an engine over land, chances are I'd have a good shot at crashing into a tree? Well, that's what I was talking about. This whole area up here is extremely forested. But hopefully I'll be within glide distance, maybe to the shoreline there. If not, I will uh, definitely, hopefully, be able to find an opening uh, or a clearing where I would be able to do my crash landing. And you can see there's plenty of roads and little tiny lakes and stuff like that, which I hopefully would be able to uh, glide to and do a crash landing into if need be. Off my right wing, there's a good view of the city of Ironwood right around here. I've never been there, I don't believe. I, I've driven through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan a couple times uh, going to uh, the regular Michigan Peninsula, I guess. I don't know what they call it the Lower Peninsula. But I, I have driven through here, but I'm not sure if I've ever been through Ironwood. Actually, I might have because I did drive through Duluth. And, you know, I would have gone that relative direction. I don't know. Anyway, I don't think you guys are interested in my personal travel habits when I am driving. So, anyway, I'll stick to my flying. So we are still off to the left of that uh, VOR, but you can see that this has now turned to a from flag since we did pass that VOR. So this radial should start to deflect to the left, and we are still flying at 7,500 feet at 100 knots, and I will bring you back if anything changes.
Welcome back guys. Uh, as you can see we are still flying 7,500 feet 100 knots but we can see that we're almost about to intercept that radial uh, from the Ironwood VOR, that 059 radial pretty much, uh, which is going to take us directly to Houghton, Michigan. Also what I'm going to do is I am down here in my nav 2, I still have 112.6 which is the uh, VOR for Duluth, I don't want that anymore, I want to connect to 112.8 which you can see I switched to, which is the Houghton VOR. Now you can see I'm not connected to it yet. Uh, the Houghton VOR only has a range of about 60 miles, so I'll probably connect to it in about another uh, 10 miles. I believe uh, Houghton to Ironwood is about 80 miles, so I have to travel about 20 miles first before I'll intercept that VOR or be able to connect to it and then uh, get onto a radial that'll intercept it. Also, you can see that this is deflecting. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly, hopefully, uh, see that deflect one more time and start adjusting my course, which was at a 0.75 to intercept that radial, and I'm going to slowly be uh, turning to intercept a 0.59, which is what I turned my heading bug to now. So I should be on a 0.59 radial, which should be what that is, and that hopefully will not deviate anymore, and will fly directly to Ironwood. You can see we're 13 miles out of, or out of, fly directly to Houghton, excuse me, and we're 13 miles away from Ironwood. So we probably got about another uh, 60 or 70 miles until we get to Houghton, Michigan. Uh, looking out the window, you can see that skies are still clear, sun is coming up. It's a, kind of a beautiful day for a flight right now. So we're just going to continue to cruise at our cruising altitude of 7,500, 100 knots. And I will uh, bring you back again if anything starts to deviate, but I have not seen any deviation. All my instrument, engine instruments look uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. Fuel is still high, fuel flow is good, EGT is good, ammeter and vacuum are good, and oil temperature is good. It, I'm not sure where the high mark is. Um, there's not really a yellow for any of these, so you don't know if you're getting to the warning stage. Uh, but pressures are good. Everything is looking good. So we're just going to continue to fly where we are flying at 110 knots roughly on ground speed. So I'm going to continue to keep that up and I will bring you back if anything changes. We are back. As you can see, we have connected to the Houghton VOR. So we are deflected there. So what I'm going to do is turn my OBS or Omni Bearing Selector knob uh, to where I intercept that radial. That'll take me directly to uh, Houghton. And as you can see, it's slightly off of our 069 or 059 heading. It's about a 064. So what I'm going to do is adjust my heading to about a 065. Uh, see if that keeps us on there. And what I'm also going to do is, since I no longer need Ironwood, I am going to change that frequency to the 110.3, which is the ILS information for Houghton. Even though I, again, I don't plan to land ILS, uh, but you know I'm I'm just using that for reference sake. So now we are flying off v VOR two or NAV two, which is uh, connected to the Houghton VOR. Uh, also, you can see if I change my DME from NAV one to NAV two, we are now about 53 miles away. So I did intercept it at about that 60 nautical mile range. So uh, the information I had was accurate that it was a 60 nautical mile uh, VOR. And I actually got that from a real world uh, airport facility directories where it gives some of that kind of information. So that is accurate again to real world. Looking out the window, you can see that uh, a lot of Upper Peninsula of Michigan, still a lot of trees. Uh, I'm loving this new uh, UTX mod that I got. Um, I, I'm going to put a link to uh, where you can purchase it in the description box below. But as you can see, it has made uh, a lot of difference to the scenery. Uh, in coordination or working with uh, Orbix, it actually makes everything look really good. There's a lot more rivers, there's a lot more roads. The roads have traffic on them, which is nice. Instead of just having only like one or two roads, major highways have the traffic. A lot of the littler roads now have traffic as well, which is quite nice. Um, see, even down here, you can see we have that little road down there, and there is some traffic on it. Um, so. 
I'm loving this mod, so I, I'd recommend if you guys want a new scenery add-on uh, that works with Orbix, if you are using Orbix. Also, I know it does work with Gex or Ground Environment Extreme or Ground Environment X, so uh, if you're familiar with that or use that and want an additional add-on, I would recommend this UTX, uh, which is, I think it's Universal Terrain X or Ultimate Terrain X. I don't remember now. Um, uh, but I'll put the link for the description, or for the product in the description box below. And we are 50 nautical miles away from Houghton, still cruising at 7,500 feet at about 100, 110 knots. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the video again. Passenger satisfaction is dipped. I'm not sure why. I wonder if they're mad You may because, now take uh, off your seatbelt. <laughs> I never saw why it dipped. So, if you guys saw in the video why it dipped, I'm going to turn off my seatbelt sign. Maybe they're just mad because the seatbelts have been on the entire time. I don't know. I'll have to uh, find out when I land. But anyway, once we get a little closer to Houghton, I'm going to bring you back for the final descent and approach into uh, Houghton County Memorial Airport. So, I'll see you guys in a little bit. Hello guys, and I am back. As you can see, we are 24 nautical miles away from Houghton Airport. Uh, and we are still relatively close to on that uh, radial to get us there. We're still flying straight. It should still, the airport should be around up here. I think it's by this kind of lake area right here. I don't have a map of the area, but I do have an airport diagram. Um, so that is what I'm flying to. And also you can kind of see the, the peninsula that we are on right now. Lake Superior is off to our left wing and you can see how vast this lake is because you cannot see a uh, horizon off in the distance. It is a massive, massive lake. And same with out on the right side. So here you can kind of tell that we're going on to that little peninsula area. Anyway, uh, what we are gonna do since we're 22 nautical miles out is I'm gonna come down and turn off my autopilot. I'm also gonna turn on my seatbelt sign because I had turned it Please off. Please fasten your seatbelt. And I am gonna start, um, I'm gonna turn autopilot back on for heading hold, but not altitude hold. So we can maintain the same heading, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start my descent into Houghton. Um, one thing about Houghton is it is a non-towered airport, so I've got my descent going. What I'm going to do is quick bring over Sky Vector. And here's Houghton, Michigan. We came from Duluth. Now around Duluth, you can see how there are these blue uh, kind of like lines in a circle, dotted lines in a circle around the airport. What that indicates to you on an aeronautical chart is that it is a towered airport. Now, if we come over to Houghton, we can see that they're not blue, but it's actually like this purplish color. Uh, what that actually indicates is that it's a non-towered airport. So there is no Houghton approach. There is no Houghton tower that we have to contact. What that means is there's going to be a CTAP frequency or common traffic advisory frequency. Also, there's not going to be ATIS information. There's going to be a SOS or ASOS, which is automatic uh, something observatory system. I don't remember it right now. Uh, so that's where we're going to have to contact to get information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my frequency to 125.67, which is the frequency for the ASOS of Houghton. So 125.67, turn that to COM1, and it'll sound a lot like an ATIS information. Automated weather observation, 1145 Wind, COM, visibility greater than 2.0 miles. Sky condition clear. Temperature 13 Celsius. Dew point 3 Celsius. Altimeter 2 Niner Niner 2. Kilo Charlie Mike X ray automated weather observation. Alright, so uh, you could hear that everything pretty much sounded like an ATIS information. The weather hasn't changed. 2 Niner Niner 2. Sky is clear. Wind no factor. So we can basically land anywhere. So the next thing we're going to do is with the CTAF frequency, uh, there is no direction on which one way, runway to land. You have to pick your own runway um, and things like that. Since there's no wind, uh, we're not going to have any decisions based off wind. So what I'm going to do is just use their primary runway, their ILS runway, their main land runway. Uh, and to find out that information, you can find it through an airport facility directory. And then I know it's runway 31. And now I brought over a 
airport uh, diagram for Houghton County or Ho yeah Houghton County Memorial Airport. And you can see that there are two main airstrips. There's uh, runway 31, runway 13, and then also runway 7 and 25. Now, runway 31 is their main runway. So that is what I plan to land on. That's their ILS runway. That's the, the primary use runway. And we can see it's at an elevation of 10,000 feet. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter a left traffic pattern into this runway. So I'm going to try to enter kind of at a 45 degree angle right here. You can see my mouse. And then around here, I'm going to turn and go into my downwind portion of my... Uh, I can't think right now. My downwind portion of my flight path. Uh, man, I can't think at all right now. Holy cow. But anyway, we're going to go down there, and then we'll turn into the base leg, and then finally the, uh, the final. Uh, and so that's what I am going to do for my traffic pattern. That is the word I was looking for. So that's my plan. I plan to enter at a 45 degree angle into a left traffic pattern, uh, go into the downwind base and then final on runway three one. So that's what I'm going to land. Now to do the, to announce my intentions, what I do is I'm going to, I've contacted them, cancel flight following. Center, Papa, hotel, Quebec, one, one, cancel flight following. Papa, hotel, Quebec, one, one, Minneapolis Center, cancellation received, squawk one, two, zero, zero, frequency change approved. So I canceled my flight following. I'm now squawking 1200. I'm going to go to my nearest airport list. And here we can see Houghton County Memorial. So what I'm going to do is select that. And this is going to show me the CTAF frequency or the, the traffic frequency. It's 122.7. So I'm going to adjust to 122.7. Whoa, not there. There. Put that in my active, 122.7. And then what you do is you would select a runway for landing. So I'll select that runway, and it's going to be 31, which I did. And then I'm going to announce my intentions with whether it's going to be a touch and go or a full stop landing. And this will be a full stop landing. And then you announce your position. So I'm going to just announce my position right now because I'm not in any part of the traffic pattern right now. I'm not on final, upwind, crosswind, downwind, or my base, and I'm not going to announce a go-around right now, so I'm just going to announce my position, Charlie, and you'll hear traffic, Papa, what they say. Quebec, one, one, is one, four miles southwest, 5,300, inbound to land, runway three, one. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm 14 nautical miles out, and I announced that I'm inbound to land on runway 31, and I gave my position. So um, that is what you do. Uh, in a little bit, I'll announce my position again. And basically how this is, is you're announcing to other aircraft who are going to be within this vicinity using this airport uh, your position. It's how you do deconfliction. It's how you make sure no one else is taking off on the runway that you're planning to take off on and how no one is going to try to land when you're trying to land and so forth. So this is how you do deconfliction when you don't have tower to deconflict for you. Uh, so that is the purpose of a CTAF frequency. Don't see the airport quite... Uh, yeah, I do. So here is the airport. Uh, you can kind of see it way off into the distance. This long runway right here is the runway 3113. And so we're going to be landing on runway 31, which is about right here. And right here, this is runway 7, and it goes up to 25. Uh, so we're going to be landing right here. And as I can see, I'm kind of off to the right of where I want to enter. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn to almost appear north heading. A little too far. I want to kind of go at a 030037-ish heading. We're still descending, kind of. Start to straighten out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep going straight right now. And then once we get lower, I want to get to about 2,100 feet is where I'm going to enter the traffic pattern at. So I still have another... Uh, 2,500 roughly to uh, descend and then I'm gonna do exactly what I said I'm gonna come this way and then I'm gonna turn and enter that pattern at a 45 degree angle and then enter the downwind left traffic 
So those are my intentions. So as of right now, everything is good. Descent checklist, I can quick verbalize some of the things that we have done since we are in the descent and we have a little bit of time. So ATIS airport information, we have checked that. We got the ASOS information. Fuel selector, we have that on both. Altimeter is 299 or 2 per the ASOS. Uh, radios are set, so we got that 122.7 frequency set, which is the uh, uh, common traffic advisory frequency or CTAF frequency for this airport. I'm going to descend a little more, and also what I'm going to do is I'm going to start trimming for a slightly slower airspeed. So you can see how I'm kind of bleeding off some of this airspeed. Give it a little more throttle. I'm going to shoot for around uh, 80 knots or so is kind of what I'm going for. All right, perfect. So we got about 80, maybe a little faster, 85 knots. Uh, <clears throat> this will start to descend again now that we're kind of leveling off. Pull back a little more throttle. Descent speed. It says 100 knots, and that's basically what I was going, but now that we're closer to the runway, I do need to descend a little fur or quicker because I do need to still drop another 2,000 feet before I get there. Uh, so that's why I want to slow down my airspeed some so I'm not traveling as much of a distance uh, and my descent will be a little quicker. Flaps, uh, just check to make sure they are up, which they are up, and check weather again, which we have done. So now we're coming into the approach checklist. Uh, which we're not using an ILS approach, so I don't have to worry about the localizer and glide slope. Landing lights are on. Fuel pump, I am not going to be turning that on right now. Speed is established. I'm not going to go into flaps. We're still too far out for that. Sorry if you noticed a little uh, kind of cut in the video there. I actually got a phone call from work. In my descent, how dare they uh, call me when I'm trying to descend and do my final approach into Houghton. Uh, but that's why I had to quickly pause the video. Um, as you can see, we still have about another 1,500 feet to descend. I'm going to now turn off my autopilot altogether. Um, and we're going to start turning slightly towards Houghton Memorial Airport right there. We're almost going to be using uh, this uh, Runway 7 as kind of a localizer, albeit, to uh, connect to uh, Runway 31 because we're going to enter that traffic pattern at about a 45 degree angle. Um, don't want to speed up, actually. That was the wrong thing. Also, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my mixture into full rich, uh, which I'm not sure if you can see that, but I, I did that down there. Still descending. Seatbelt signs are still on. I'm going to go down to my lights uh, and just check that. I'm actually going to turn off my panel lighting, nav lighting. Why that turns off, I don't know. I'm not going to turn on my fuel pump. Everything is looking good right now. Um, so now it's just kind of a little bit of a waiting game. And while we do that, you can kind of, again, see how nice uh, some of the UTX uh, textures and and what that add-on does is it really makes the city look good. Uh, there's a lot more roads that you can see have traffic on them. Kind of makes things come to life a little more. So, again, I'm really liking that add-on. Now that we're getting lower, you can kind of see how the terrain is starting to change. You can actually see some of the hills on the ground. Because sometimes when you're uh, up, even at 7,000 feet, you don't see the hills. Uh, but now you can kind of see how there are hills and how the train is going. You can see even right there there's a hill and it drops off to where that river is. The tower there, we got to keep making sure we don't run into any uh, obstructions like that. We're doing good for our descent. Uh, we should be able to enter the traffic pattern right at about 2100, which is where I kind of want to be at. So I'm happy with where I descended and when I descended. You can see all the traffic down there kind of going along. Maybe a little more traffic than uh, realistic. Uh, I don't. Houghton's not that big of a city, so I can't imagine that they would have that much traffic going on. But whatever. It's fun to see vehicles moving. I hated, you know, in default FSX when you're when you're traveling and you don't see vehicles on the roads. It's kind of one of those frustrating things where it just makes the world seem dead. So it's nice to have those vehicles. <clears throat> 
All right, we are pretty much almost at 2,100 feet and we are gonna enter our traffic pr pattern perfect almost. So I'm gonna start to uh, give a little more power and start to level out. And also I'm gonna get a little closer and then I'm gonna do a right turn to enter at a 40 degree or 45 degree angle into the downwind portion. I'm gonna announce my position one more time and I'm climbing down so I gave too much power. One is two miles west, 2000. Inbound to land, runway 31. I'm going to start turning. Got to give it a little more power. Trim the aircraft. Start turning, and now I'm going to announce that I'm on the downwind leg. Hilo, Charlie, Mike, X ray, traffic, Papa, Hotel, Quebec, 1 1 is on downwind, runway 3 1. Start to level out, look out the left wing, and we are getting near that beam point where is uh, the area where we put in our first detent of flaps. So you can see the piano keys right here, the landing area, and what we're going to do now is we're at that beam point, so what we're going to do is put in flaps 10 degrees. It's going to lift the nose some as it's going to want to bleed off some of that airspeed, which is good retrim the aircraft to keep us relatively level. I'm dipping a little below that uh, 2100 foot mark. I'm going to give it more power because we are going a little slower than I want to go too. Now what we're looking at is for about 45 degrees between my elevator and my left wing is where that runway wants to be. And that's where we're gonna do our turn into the base leg. It's kind of a nice view right here. Got the, the lake and the river. You can kind of see the hills, the traffic going along. Happy with my scenery add-ons that I have. I'm very happy. Looks good, I think. Uh, the sun, I think the water looks pretty pretty good, especially with the water, or the, the sunlight and whatnot. Uh, we're going a little too far, so I'm going to start turning into my base. Hilo, Charlie, Mike, X-Ray, traffic, Papa, hotel, get back to one, <coughs> one is on Excuse base, me. runway three, one. If I sound kind of like a frog, uh, it's because I'm fighting a cold. I'm kind of getting over the, the latter stages of a cold, uh, so... My throat was sore. I had a little bit of a cough, as you could kind of hear. So <laughs> I'm sorry if I sound terrible. So we're just kind of keeping that runway in the field of view right now. That is runway 31 where we want to land. Uh, we're on base leg right now. What I'm going to do is do another detent of flaps. I'm also going to increase power some because I don't want to uh, bleed off any more airspeed. I don't want to go any slower than 65, 70 knots right now. <clears throat> and I'm going to start doing another left bank into the final. Just going to double check that my landing lights and everything are on, which they are. Also altimeter at 29 or 9 or 2, which it is. And I need to turn a little sharper to intercept. Overshot the runway slightly, so I'm going to have to uh, double back a little bit. That's all right. Pull back a little more throttle because we are a little high and we can also see that on the glide slope indicator that we're a little high. Also I'm noticing that there are no Pappy or Vassy light so it's kind of a nice thing to have the glide slope indicator right there from the ILS uh, just because we can use that for reference as what the glide slope should be since there are no Pappy lights or Vassy lights slowed down a little too much. I need to keep a little bit of airspeed. I don't want to go much below 60 knots. <clears throat> I'm going to announce on final. Hilo, Charlie, Mike, X-Ray, traffic, Papa, hotel, Quebec, 1-1 one, one is on final, runway 3-1 to land. My final detent of flaps is coming in. And we 
we are looking good on our approach right now. I'm happy with it. Keep trimming out the aircraft. Give it a little more power right there. Uh, we're slightly below the glide slope. Coming in. Rudder to compensate for going left. Start pulling back some of my throttle. Come down. Pitch up the nose ever so slightly. Kill some power. And we have touched down. We have landed on the runway at Houghton uh, County Memorial Airport. Pretty nice landing, I think. A little bit off to the right. Curious to see why their uh, satisfaction has dropped as well. Traffic off into the distance, which is kind of fun to see is announce that I am clear of the runway. So once I get past, you will see that as an option. So there it is. Kilo, Charlie, Mike, X-ray, <laughs> traffic, Papa, hotel, come back, one, one. I'm gonna stop here. The runway. Now, another thing about CTAP frequencies is there's no ground frequency either. So you're not changing between tower and ground or anything like that. So you're not going from a CTAF frequency to a ground frequency. You stay on the CTAF frequency even when you're on the taxiway. Um, but anyway, so we have announced clear of the runway. What I'm going to do is hit control period, which is parking brake, and I'm going to go into my taxi to ramp <coughs> checklist. Excuse me. Uh, so strobe light is going to come off. Flaps are going to be fully retracted back into the up position. Taxi light is coming on. Landing light is coming off. And speed, we're not going to go any faster than 20 knots. Throttle as required. Elevator is going to be set to takeoff trim. Avionics and radios are still set. And uh, transponder is at 1200. So all of that is good. What I am going to do then is start my taxi. <coughs> also, here's the terminal. Uh, since I have been here before, uh, you can see the terminal right here. We're on taxiway alpha. There are no parking spots anywhere on this uh, tarmac area. And also, um, another thing to note is, uh, here's the terminal, gas is over here. You could park anywhere. I'm just gonna park in front of that terminal. Cause like I said, I did drive this entire taxiway up here and out here looking for parking spots and there are no markings at all for uh, parking. So I'm just gonna kinda <laughs> Start slowing down a little bit. Give it a little bit of a turn. Cut the power. One final break and turn, and we are good. That's where we're going to stop. So I'm going to hit control period to turn on my parking brake, which you can see it come out. I'm going to go through my shutdown checklist. So parking brake is on, throttle, throttle is set to idle. Fuel pump, I never turned that on, so it is off. Avionic switch, I'm going to come down to my switches and turn that off. Taxi lights, I'm going to turn that off. Nav lights are going to come off. Pedo heat is already off. Mixture fuel flow is going to the cutoff. Magneto starter switches are going to the off position. Beacon, I'm going to keep that on. Uh, panel lighting is off. Battery and alternator are coming off as well. So our engine should be shut down. Shutdown checklist complete. Securing aircraft. Parking brake is verified that it is set, which we can see down here. Throttle is at idle and all switches are off. So what I'm going to do now is hit Shift E and open my door for my passengers to deboard my plane. <coughs> Should have probably did that when uh, I was going through the checklist so I wouldn't have to wait. Verify everything is off, which it is, except for that beacon light. Looking good. Oh, oh no. no. Yeah, it's very cold. Very cold. Ha ha ha. There you go. Alright, so they are all gone. So what I'm going to do is go to my FS passengers and end this flight. End flight. 
it was already registered as you can see it was a nice landing kiss as they want to say uh going a little slower than i would wanted i usually try to land at about 65 knots uh before whatever yeah, I'll, I'll take it uh it was a good flight didn't understand why they were kept their seat belts on it was the seat belts ah well i'm sorry guys i made you keep on your seat belts you know <coughs> there's nowhere to go in a small cessna 172 so whatever make sure that you uh remember to turn off the seatbelt sign once you're at a cruising level oh well Look at this. We made $10,000 on this one. You can see that our uh, cargo income was $46 for 119 pounds, even though I put in 120 pounds. Uh, fuel cost, we used 85 pounds. I don't remember exactly what we had for starting, <coughs> but that'll be a good uh, thing to look at. If we burned 85 pounds in, where's our distance? 152 nautical miles. Pilot bonus was 80 points. Uh, I made a very smooth landing, and I landed at the scheduled airport. So all in all, it was good flight, made some money, and I am happy at it. And we are finally at Houghton, Michigan, and I've checked the recordings. I know it was recording the right display, so I am happy. Uh, so again, thank you guys for watching these videos. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or just want to say hi, feel free to send me a message or a comment. I love to hear from you guys. Also, do uh, be sure to subscribe if you like the videos as I try to keep them coming regularly. And uh, thanks again for watching. Not next flight, but the next flight after that. <coughs> Man, this cough. Excuse me. Uh, my next flight after that, uh, I should have a new plane as well. So that's something to look forward to. Actually, I'm, yeah, I'm going to do it after the next flight. I think what I'm going to do next is uh, fly down to Green Bay unless someone gives me a comment saying, hey, fly here instead. Uh, so I think that's what I'm going to be doing for my next flight. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate it. Thanks for the subscriptions and the comments. And I will see you all next time.